Good evening and welcome to the third of our Holy Week meditations. Many years ago, Tim and I were walking in Durham City by the river and we saw a strange shelter across the way. So we crossed Prevens Bridge and saw that it was shaped like a room, a little elongated, and the door was open. We went in and found ourselves in the upper room and we sat down and sat quietly in a different place. And so now this evening, we're going to do this. We're going to let the scripture in St. John read us as we listen. And it's in the now, because the Holy Week story is one that we repeat every year. And the message is for us in the present. And so I'm reading to you our reading for this evening, which is in John chapter 13, reading from verse 21 to 32. Jesus has just washed the disciples' feet. And we know too, there is an underground rumbling. If we read in St. Luke, we have another aspect of this story, which is not for tonight. But the disciples were grumbling about being important. And then we have these words, beginning from verse 21. Jesus has just told them that someone would betray him. After he said this, Jesus was troubled in spirit and testified, I tell you the truth, one of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. One of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon motioned to this disciple and said, ask him what he means. Leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I have dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered into him. What you are about to do, Jesus told him, do quickly. But no one at the take meal understood why Jesus said this. And since Judas had the charge of the money, some thought Jesus was telling him to buy what was needed for the feast or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. It was night. When he was gone, Jesus said, now, is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will glorify the Son in himself and will glorify him at once. This is the Gospel of Christ. And so we come to a moment of great poignancy in the story of Jesus. And it has been a privilege for me over these last few days to sit with this story. It's a tragic moment. It's a moment of great intimacy. And if we look at what Jesus already knew, we see in verse one of this chapter, he knew his time had come. He knew, verse 3, that God had put all things 
under his power. He knew that Jesus, verse 11, was to betray him. And so he tells his dear friends this and searches deeply into their listening hearts. And Jesus speaks some words that are very sharp. Verse 18, he who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. That's the quote from Psalm 41. It's a phrase full of cruelty, of violence. And yet somehow we feel that in Jesus' mouth, it's not angry, but sorrowful. For Jesus is troubled in spirit, St. John says. One commentator has told this story as being love's last appeal. And so let us look closely at what's happening here. Where are they sitting? There have been so many paintings, so many depictions of this upper room. And some people think that maybe as Jesus welcomed his dear friends around the table, he might have said to Judas, Judas, sit on my left, a place of privilege, a place for a dear friend. And we know that on the other side was the disciple whom Jesus loved, we think could have been John. There's been, again, much speculation. And they're round the table, they're leaning in as they lay there, half lay, leaning on one elbow with one up the right hand, probably available, the right hand for cleanliness to eat. Everybody is vulnerable. I think the atmosphere must have been so intense. And so perhaps the first of love's appeal to Judas was having him sit right beside him. Our Lord calls him there. And nobody would have been bothered. He had a title. He was the treasurer. He was quite important. And indeed, we know in that lovely story of Mary anointing our Lord, he had protested. He was guarding the money, it would appear. Appear. Protesting. Maybe protesting a little bit too much. Oh, beware of the one who has a big title. It was important and protest loudly. And sadly, we've seen in the history of our church and even today, a protester about something may be guilty of something. And there is Judas. You should have kept that money. In his heart. Dear friends, he was a thief. So winsomely, our Lord gives him this chance. And then he says, kind of code, but not really, as the custom was. And here is love's next appeal. He says, the one who will betray me will be the one to whom I dip this bread in the sauce in the tasty morsel dish. And I give it to him. That was a custom. In the story of Ruth, when Boaz wants to show Ruth that he really likes her and appreciates her, he invites her to dip the morsel into the wine. This was a familiar gesture. And here is another appeal. Judas, I'm giving you this special tidbit. I'm looking at you. Are you looking at me? Can you see that I'm calling you? And we read in the scripture, in a flash, that as soon as he had taken the bread, he got up and he got ready to go out. And then the friends hear Jesus say something, and it's quite ordinary, really. What you've got to do, do quickly. But the shock that's gone through the dear friends. And what fascinated me as I sat with it was they could not guess 
who would betray him? It wasn't apparent. They'd argued about importance. They hadn't argued about who might betray. And dear Peter, he, bless him, he daren't ask our Lord. He had to say, ask him. And yet it was Peter's style always to blurt things out, but something stopped him. Because in another day, he would betray him too. Was something clutching at his heart then? So follow with me, dear friends. Judas receiving a token as treat still gets up from the table. What you've got to do, do quickly. And the friends would just think, oh, well, that's what treasurers do. He'll be doing the shopping or maybe he'll give some money to the poor. Follow with him, dear friends, because St. John opens the door and we go through the door into the dark with Judas. And then St. John writes words which have been held and treasured and which have struck the heart of the believer down the years. It was night. I wonder what happened then when the door closed. As we read the scripture, it feels as though whew, the atmosphere changes. And as we look at the scripture, we see that verse 31, when he was gone, Jesus said, now. And he talked about being glorified, about the Son of Man being glorified, about God being glorified. Had something ended or had something begun at that moment? It was night. And when our Lord looks at us with love, when he appeals to us. Dear friends, we might be about to walk into the dark in our own lives. We're all in very different places, even this very moment, even after the joy of a freedom yesterday that came with the sunshine. So what is happening? He's calling now. The story is happening now, dear love. There's a hymn that's been staying with me, which begins, oh, the bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be when I let the Saviour's pity plead in vain and proudly answered all of self and none of thee. So dear Judas thought he knew the plan. He thought there'll be a revolution. And instead he'd betrayed himself. He'd betrayed his dreams. He'd betrayed his wholeness. So we pray, oh holy one, oh whole one, keep me holy, keep me whole. Do not let let me be lost. Jesus will meet Judas again in the garden. He will come to him, Rabbi, greetings, and kiss him. And Jesus says, Friend, do what you are here to do. I was deeply shocked at this point because I discovered something I had never known. Jesus uses a word for friend, which is in the Greek, I believe, hetairos, meaning of, of somebody who has abused a privileged friendship. So he looks at him and calls him friend. 
and he is saying goodbye at the same time. So here begins the trial of our Lord. But it's also so sadly an ending to the friendship between Jesus and Judas. Love's last appeal has not won him. Lord, if we have in our hearts any unresolved endings, any unresolved ambition, speak to our hearts, we pray. So always, as we read this Holy Week story, dear friends, we remember it is happening now. We remember as we walk this journey with our Lord, he is calling us, he is appealing to us. And I would like to read to you some more of that hymn. For in verse two, it says, yet he found me. I beheld him bleeding on the accursed tree, heard him pray, forgive them, Father. And my wistful heart said faintly, some of so and some of thee. And then the writer goes on, and I'm sure I've known this in my experience, God comes to us winsomely, pleadingly, as he is to you, dear brothers and sisters tonight. Day by day, his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, sweet and strong, and are so patient, brought me lower, while I whispered, less of self and more of thee, dare I trust you, Lord? I'm sure, dear ones, like me, you know these moments in your life. Our Lord loves us so much but he doesn't force us. And then we have this wonderful last verse, higher than the highest heaven, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord, thy love at last has conquered. Grant me now my supplication, none of self and all of thee. Shall we pray? Dear Father, may we walk this day in the way of the cross and always be ready to share its load. So may this moment, Lord, in history not be left there as we sit at the table with our Lord and we shall do so tomorrow in that precious communion. May we know your call to us in the present moment that we may live in the power of the Spirit and in the presence of Jesus for the whole world. So can we hold hands? I'm holding my palm cross as we discover together what has been called the most remarkable joy and the most remarkable sorrow as we take up our cross woven into the pattern of our days. Amen.